Hi, and welcome to the Haverhill Journal, where we give you a look each week at what's going on in our city. I'm Lindsay Paris, and this week, we're traveling to commemorate a fateful day in history, seeing how local responders keep prepared and protected, and hearing about holiday events hosted by the Lions Club and the Buttonwoods. But first, folks all over the Merrimack Valley are decorating floats, unfurling banners, and practicing their marching routines to ready themselves for one of Haverhill's favorite annual events, the VFW Santa Parade, this Sunday. It's an extra special parade this year, being the 50th anniversary, and we talked to parade organizers and visited two float builders to get a sneak peek. <laughs> How do you know the holidays have arrived in Haverhill? When you see St. Nick and his friends in the city rolling up Main Street in the Santa Parade. At the Boys and Girls Club, kids are painting trees, wheels, and themselves as they get ready. We're working on the float for the uh, Santa Parade, which starts at Hunking School and ends at the VFW. It's always a fun time. We did it last year. All the kids had a great time. I mean, I'm usually in the Santa Parade. It's just a fun time for everybody. Do you go to Santa Parade before? What do you like about it? it? I like that it's it's really, really fun, and you can see a lot of people on, on like the floats. And my favorite part is when they pass out candy. We're very excited about the 50th golden anniversary of the VFW Santa Parade. I think it's awesome, and uh, we've decided for our theme to be the golden opportunities. Uh, because here at the Boys and Girls Club, you know, not even though we are called nonprofit, I call it for purpose. The theme is uh, follow your dreams with uh, showing that the Boys and Girls Club offers golden opportunities. And the kids really love Frozen, so for the little princesses that we have, there was many, many kids that, learn, that know how to sing Let It Go, so they're all going to show up with their princess uh, dresses. And then um, we love Minions. We're calling it the Royal Rebels. The, call, the kids call it Royal Rebels. So we have our royalty, and we have our little rebel Minions. Are you going to be Minions? No, we're going to be princesses. Backup princess. Oh, you're a backup princess? Uh-huh. And I take cover for the people who are sick and they can't go to the parade. Yeah, I'm going to be a minion. Me too. You're going to be walking in the Santa Parade? Yes, I will. You're going to be on this, this float? Um, it depends. Usually I'm with the VFW and I'm like with the costumes, but if that doesn't go through this year, then 100% I will be with the Boys and Girls Club. What's your favorite thing about Santa Parade? That they have lots of cars that are from the 90s and it's really pretty. I like seeing all the floats when we're walking. Longtime parade officials Tom Sullivan and Roland Plord gave us a little history. Uh, we started in 1964. Um, the VFW decided that we really needed to keep the tradition going. So we've been doing it, well this is our 50th anniversary this year. We're calling it our Golden Christmas. Um, we've got some new bands, we've got some new clowns this year, so it should be quite interesting. Well, back in 1964, my father um, felt it was important to keep the parade going. The Chamber of Commerce had run it for many years, but they decided to move on and gave that up. Um, so he thought it would be a great idea if the VFW took over the parade, since he had a drum corps already in place. And back then, the drum corps would barter with each other. They'd go to each other's parades, and that's really how you did a parade back in the day. My first parade was 1965 when I joined the Shoemakers Drum and Bugle Corps. And I've been with the committee now 29 years, and this is my 10th year as chairman. What makes this parade special is the fact that it is, it is the longest consecutive running event here in the city of Haverhill. Um, it's pretty amazing that we've had this event going strong for, over, for 50 years, and uh, it's truly special. No one has a parade like Haverhill. We're the largest parade in the uh, north of Boston area, and probably, uh, comparably speaking, we're about the same size as the Quincy Parade down on the South Shore. So there's something to be said for that. You know, no other community has what we have here. Can you tell us who Santa is? Never. That's, Santa, that's, right? It's Santa. That's it. He comes down for the day. He flies in the night before. We put him up, take care of him, and then he's gone right after the parade in his red pickup truck. <laughs> what do you do after the parade is over? Go to Disney World? Yeah, I wish I could go to Disney World. No, I usually just go home and cook Thanksgiving dinner because I don't get a lot of time with my wife for the past month. So, you know, <laughs> she says goodbye in September. I'll see you Thanksgiving Day. Meanwhile, over at Whittier Tech, Hammers are pounding and glitter is flying as students work diligently to maintain their record of top-placing floats. 
Well, today I what I did was I spray painted the hooves for our reindeer that we're making, and then I put like nice glitter on them to make it pop, and uh, it turned out really nice. I love making the sculptures that you see out on the float. Uh, I've made the Yukon Cornelius that's on the sled on top, and then uh, the dentist I helped out is being made right now, and then the airplane and the doll as well. I had uh, one of my students who said, oh, I'm so excited. I've been going to this parade since I was four, four years old, and now I get to work on it. The theme was uh, golden holidays this year. So when CR teacher got that, she came over and shared it with me. And the art teacher and the students in art came up with some designs on what to do for the float. And once she put the designs on paper, um, the carpentry kids started putting their heads together on how we were going to build all these things. Carpentry students, art students, HVAC, uh, welding, graphics, electrical, uh, everyone is auto body. Everyone works together to put this float together and the kids are very excited. So we've been waiting for two years pretty much because freshman you only do a little stuff and then sophomore year you do like furniture working and then junior year it's like the big house and everything so that's mainly what the float is. It's building a big house and just building like just huge things and it's really fun. It's, I love it. When I got the chance to do the float we started off slow coming up with ideas and Bev DeSalvo decided since it's golden Christmas is the theme, why don't we do some of the golden books and make it a little nostalgic. So um, as the kids start to see what golden books are, I, I don't know if we outdated ourselves with golden books, but they do know about the golden books. They have all these ideas that are just building, well what if we do this and how about we do that, Miss Susie can I help you out with this? My favorite thing is probably like the creative aspect of it, like building a lot of the little things, which you mainly do in art class, but you do a lot of the painting here. and. Um, we each do like individual projects, so I think that's really fun. I'm in metal fabrication, it's lots of fun for me. I was there when we made the sleigh that was outside, and it was, lots, it was really cool to see how we made that. It's the oldest tradition in Haverhill. It's been going on for 50 years, and they wanted to keep it going, and they want everyone to mm -hmm. keep these traditions. Sunday's forecast to be a beautiful day, but if you can't make it out, watch HC Media's live coverage of the Santa Parade on Channel 22, beginning at 1 p.m. This weekend also marks the 51st anniversary of President John F. Kennedy's assassination on November 22, 1963. That fateful day is being observed in locations across Massachusetts, including the modest house on a tree-lined street in Brookline where the President was born in 1917. The Journal stopped in at this National Historic Site to learn more about his early life. Welcome to our home. Mr. Kennedy and I bought and moved into this house when we were married in 1914. And this house holds many happy memories. In honor of this weekend's anniversary, we came down here to the John F. Kennedy birthplace here on Beale Street in Brookline, and we have Ranger Jim Roberts with us. How are you doing, Jim? Very well, thanks, Lindsay. Okay. How are you today? Good. So tell us a little bit about what you have going on this weekend. Well, we uh, commemorate the passing of John Fitzgerald Kennedy every year right around November 22nd. Uh, so this year, on November 22nd at 2 p.m., we'll be doing a special wreath-laying ceremony. We'll have uh, some local clergy. We'll be doing some readings from uh, various aspects uh, of JFK's career. We're really uh, not so much commemorating his passing, but more commemorating his life and his legacy. Mm -hmm. We'll also be open from 10 to 4, both Saturday and Sunday, and the site will be free to the public. Just driving in here, you know, you're right off of Coolidge Corner, but it's like stepping into the 1920s. What made them choose this neighborhood? Well, they chose this neighborhood mainly because it, uh, the open feel of it. This was the last house on the street. The rest of the houses on both sides had yet to be developed. The lots were in place, but the houses hadn't been built. When the site was originally opened in 1969, this was how you entered the home. And we uh, like to start all of our tours on the front porch uh, in order to keep um, true to Mrs. Kennedy's spirit of visiting her home. As Mrs. Kennedy would have said when she was here, welcome to our home. This is just like, just stepped into 1915. Yes, and if you uh, came to visit when the Kennedy family was here, you'd probably be greeted by one of her servants. She had two domestic servants who lived in the house at the time. So when Mrs. Kennedy returned here in 1966, she used a decorator from Jordan Marsh named Robert Luddington, who is still working for the Kennedy family today. She and he had the house completely stripped down to its bare surfaces, and then they refinished based on what she remembered her home looking like. 
Since the living room in the days before radio and television was a place for the family to be together, we shall start here. When Mrs. Kennedy got married, her uncles, her father's brothers, Edward and James, purchased the piano that you see here in the living room. And since uh, Mrs. Kennedy was an accomplished pianist, uh, she began instruction early on to, with all of her children on that piano as well. This dining room might well have been the most important room in the house for much of our family life. While they were small, the children had their meals at the table by the window. The silver napkin rings and the porringers were used by the president and his older brother and carry their monograms. One can see that this is cer certainly a room that the family would have gathered at meal times to uh, share their meals and, and of course uh, share their ideas, but it was very important for Mrs. Kennedy to uh, test her children's uh, learning and development. So it is in this room she uses the, uh, the gathering around the table to see how well they are getting along in their development. And uh, even things like uh, what was the topic of the sermon at, at church that day. And she does say, you know, of course, if they didn't know one week, they certainly wouldn't know the next. So now we're up here on the second floor of the JFK birthplace and we're going to explore some of the Kennedy family bedrooms. Yes, uh, Lindsay, this is, these are the more private spaces in the home. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the only reason you would have come up here if you lived here, I mean, when, when the Kennedys lived here, is if you had been invited to stay overnight, because there's mm -hmm. a guest bedroom here as well. But up here is the nursery, which was shared by JFK and his brother. Also the master bedroom where JFK and his two sisters, Rosemary and Kathleen, were born. The president was born in the twin bed near the window on May 29, 1917, at three o'clock in the afternoon. They always used the bed near the window so that if the baby were born in the daytime, the light would be the best for the doctor. The story goes that that is the same bed. The one closest to the window mm -hmm. is the original bed that uh, was used in that bedroom. Um, the second bed is a reproduction to match. And that's partly because uh, Mrs. Kennedy tells us that uh, she lent the second bed to JFK to use in his apartment on Beacon Hill when he had to establish a residency to run for Congress. And he never returned it. <laughs> this room is referred to as the nursery, and it is in this room that JFK would spend his first three years with his brother. This bassinet has been used by Kennedy children and grandchildren in the years since Joe Jr. and Jack first slept in it here in the nursery. The christening dress in the corner was given to me by my mother-in-law. All the children and John Jr., the president's son, have worn this dress. Well, Lindsay, that pretty much concludes the tour of the JFK birthplace. And I understand that they moved right down the road after they moved out of this house in 1920. They did. They only moved a few blocks away at the corner of Naples and Abbotsford Road, and they lived there from 1920 to 1927. Good. All right, Jim. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Free guided tours of the home are available by appointment through the winter until the site reopens to the public in May. To book a tour, visit the home's website at nps.gov backslash jofi. Preparedness was the topic of the day at Northern Essex Community College's state emergency drill and tabletop exercise. Representatives from NECC, the Haverhill and Methuen Police Departments, Georgetown Fire Department, EIS, and other organizations gathered on Friday, October 31st to map out strategies that can be used in emergency situations, and we spoke to some of the participants. What, was, uh, what happened was a, an incident was proposed, uh, a simulation, uh, there was an incident here at the school. These kinds of simulations are important, not just for the aspect of this particular kind of an incident occurring, but also getting all of the different indices that are involved in understanding what goes into the thought process with police, with fire, with other emergency services, to understand that the decisions that they make or the decisions that they don't make do have a ripple effect. It's, it's so important to have people understand that things do happen. It's a fluid situation. There's always um, intricacies that are not brought up when you're writing down a plan. Because I always say, 
you know, you can have an A plan and do it as at a D level. You, we end up having a D plan, no matter how well the plan is, is created. I think what we get the most out of it is, is the intercommunications. As you saw today, we put everyone in groups by assignment, and people forget to talk to each other. So a tabletop exercise like this, one, it stresses you. Two, it forces the communications. So when we do, uh, in June, when we come and do the full-scale uh, exercise, which will actually be a scenario outside, they'll already be comfortable with communications. Uh, the involvement of the students, I think, is extremely important. All the elements seem to come together quite well, and they took the exercise quite seriously, which is important. Exercises like this and going forward in the future um, is, is uber important to make sure that people are prepared for any kind of catastrophes that might occur. Very important safety drill. NECC is proud to partner with local responders for events like the tabletop exercise. Looking for a gorgeously decorated Christmas tree without all the muss and fuss? Head down to the Buttonwoods Museum for your chance to win one of over 100 trees, wreaths, and centerpieces at their annual Festival of Trees. Kaylee Perez got the details. I'm Kaylee Pere of the Buttonwoods Museum. Are you getting excited for the holidays? So are we. We're gearing up for our 13th annual Festival of Trees. We're filling two whole galleries with trees, wreaths, and centerpieces that will all be raffled off to you, our visitor. So join us between November 29th and December 14th for the Festival of Trees. You have a chance of winning a tree, there'll be musical performances, and other special events going on. So check out our website at buttonwoods.org or give us a call at 978-374-4626. The Buttonwoods Museum. Connect with history together. When you're there, don't forget to bid on the HC Media Tree, trimmed with ornaments to showcase our terrific volunteers. Kids, get ready to eat a delicious meal with the man in the red suit himself at the Haverhill Lions Club Breakfast with Santa, Saturday morning, December 6th from 8.30 to 11.30 a.m. at Maria's Family Restaurant, located at 81 to 83 Essex Street. Bring your camera for a picture with Santa, and if you're looking to get rid of that outgrown winter coat, the Coats for Kids Drive will be accepting gently used winter outerwear. Tickets are $5 and will be sold at the door. For more information, call 978 372-4675. If you have a story or event you'd like to see featured on the Haverhill Journal, call us at 978-372-8070 or email info at mediahc.org. And don't forget to like us on Facebook or at our YouTube channel, HCTV Haverhill. And that's what's happening in Haverhill the week of November 20th. The Journal would like to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving, and we will be back on December 4th. I'm Lindsay Paris, and we'll see you next time.